Okay, Marilyn, welcome to Singapore again and to CLC. Well, thank you very much. It's always such a pleasure to be here. I think that uh, over all these years, I've learned more from being here than yeah, I brought. But it's great to exchange great ideas. To CLC and to Singapore, so you have been here, you know, um, since the 1980s, and you were personally involved in the planning of downtown Marina Bay in the early 2000s as a partner of Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. What were some of the key thinking and considerations that went into SOM's master plan for this area? If you could share that with us again. Uh, well, it was a delightful surprise uh, to uh, uh, have an opportunity to work on Marina Bay. I had first arrived in Singapore to work on projects a few years before. Uh, and the first project we worked on was the construction of the original part of the Red Line, which extended from Marina Bay and went out toward the airport, stopping at Tanamara. So we had an opportunity through having worked on that, that transportation project, that connective project, to understand how important Marina, was, Marina Bay would be mm -hmm. for the expansion of the CBD, which in the mind of the city leaders at that point was already getting pretty crowded. Uh, think about how much has happened since then, and there would be an opportunity to extend it. We were made familiar with some of the wonderful and uh, uh, really optimistic planning that had been done and the schemes that had been put together by both Kenzo Tange and IMP. I think what was different was that by then, Singapore was very, very focused on remaining, it retaining its strong position as a place for the international and globalized firms mm -hmm. to come and locate. So as technology was beginning to appear on the scene, it was clear that the Central Business District needed to expand and in particular needed to provide a place where emerging technology companies, where financial investors, where the international group of firms and businesses that was in many ways directing the flow of international capital, so Singapore would be a great place for them to locate. Mm -hmm. Right, and now that you have seen that part of the plan has, be, has been implemented and you know we have the new downtown uh, by Marina Bay, um, has it turned out to be the way that you have envisaged that it would be and what you like most about the area today? You know, when you work on very big master plan visions, uh, you have to be clear with yourself mm -hmm. that you're setting a framework for development. And if you have lived up to the expectations that you set for yourself and that your client has set for you, you know that it's just a starting point where things are gonna change. I sometimes get frustrated now when there are 20 year master plans and people still think, oh, well it said that we're gonna do this here and this kind of block and this kind of building. And it doesn't really work out that way. The market comes and good government responds, keeping the principles alive, but changing things. Uh, near the end of the planning work we did for Marina Bay, we came up with a concept that I liked very much from the beginning. And I want to call attention to it because I think it's one of the strongest parts of the Marina Bay Plan. It became clear that development in the new area could feel very isolated from the hotels to the east and from the CBD, which was immediately across Shenton Way, but might have seemed quite far. So we came up with the idea that what we needed was a pedestrian walk around the entire perimeter of the bay, which would cross the river twice, go up the east side and come back around. As I recall, it was about a two kilometer walk or so, maybe not for the daytime mm -hmm. so much in Singapore, mm -hmm. but certainly wonderful in the nighttime with the way we envisioned this new body of water uh, bringing people to the water and creating value and creating new experiences. So the fact that that was taken in hand and implemented strongly, I think had a powerful influence on the positive way that certain aspects of Marina Bay have turned out. It opened the door to something that had not been envisioned. Uh, at the time the Marina Bay plan was uh, developed, there wasn't an idea yet public that there might be casino, that there might be a real tourist destination. 
and that the gardens by the bay would become such a wonderful, large public amenity with very special attractions that would bring crowds of people. So I'm very glad that those pieces of the plan came together to support a different land use than we had originally intended, but one that I think is very, very strong. Right, indeed. I remember taking walks around the promenade and it's, it's very much the buzz uh, of Marina Bay uh, and, and it's that promenade uh, is kind of the route to appreciate, say, like I like Marina Bay and so on. So I think it's been a very successful public space. And well, I actually yeah, think that's uh -huh. been one of the great changes yeah, in Singapore, so. which yeah, is the, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I first came, if you went over to Boat Quay, you could only walk around the CBD side because that's the true. governmental buildings were still on the mm -hmm. east. And claiming that for the Asian Civilization Museum as, as the new Supreme Court building was built and really extending the connectivity of when that one loop mm -hmm. around the mm -hmm. bay and mm -hmm. making another, than making the walk up the Singapore River. This has really become a pedestrian friendly city. Uh, if you choose your time and walk at the right pace, I think it is something that truly knits all the, the districts of the central area of Singapore together in a really delightful and special way. Yeah, great, and you had a big hand in that. <laughs> okay. A small one. <laughs> okay, and over the past few years, um, we have seen many cities around the world um, coming up with uh, new kinds of workspaces that provision for leisure and social amenities and the design of public realms. For instance, we've seen the increase in demand for more flexible co-working spaces and the rise of millennials in the workforce. So how do you think cities should respond to these trends and demands in order to stay livable and attractive to businesses and residents alike? So if we think about Marina Bay and what we originally intended there, mm. I think that we together were very successful in creating development opportunities that would serve those very large international corporations. And we proposed that there would be interwoven residential use. I think we didn't quite envision that the development of the economy would mean that each one of those parcels really started to become priced and plan to fulfill its maximum possibility rather than introducing a variety of building types and a variety of building so sizes mm -hmm. so that different businesses could also participate. And of course, the world has moved very quickly to a fascination with something that's becoming very essential to our future, which is how do we move away from the large, highly skilled, highly directed, and generally highly profit-oriented organization to incorporate the scrappy startups, the people with a new idea. And of course, our economy around the world now is moving to place a very high value on those new ideas. The ideas that take the wonderful things that research is bringing to us about data handling and communication and turning it into an opportunity for businesses to exist all the way along the chain of activities that happens there. It also comes at a time when automation itself will be changing the kinds of jobs that all of us hold. Not you and I, but our children are going to be working in very different ways than we did. And they're going to be perhaps changing jobs more often, moving on more quickly, but they are finding themselves capable of working in very collaborative ways, sharing ideas that help everyone move forward together. And all of those things lead us as placemakers and designers, planners who are trying to guide the city in a certain direction without controlling it too much, to scratch our heads and say, well, what are the kind of places where we can attract those rising members of the workforce who take risks, produce new ideas, and actually have a powerful impact on the way we live. And so um, with you know, these kinds of trends in cities, um, how about, how, you know, how do we foster a greater sense of inclusivity in urban places? Because you know, we are talking about millennials, people who work in high-end offices, but how about everybody else? 
It's sort of amazing to me mm -hmm. in my lifetime mm -hmm. uh, that as people who travel the world and have the opportunity to visit different cultures, to see different places and different styles of living, that we have become very accepting of difference and ways to work together. But at the same time, our economy has operated in ways that increase the distance between the wealthy and those who have not had full opportunity to take advantage of these new changing directions in the economy. Similarly, technology can either be a force for good, it can help us interact more successfully together, share ideas, enjoy the free time we have, be very productive at work, or it can isolate us from each other as we each live our life in our screen, at our desk, and uh, not spending that time to get out and engage personally. So the impulse that we've always had in cities, and to the extent that we as architects and planners and landscape architects influence them, we've always tried to make places where people can go to meet each other, to interact. And in those conversations, to appreciate our differences, but also to find our commonalities. So I think even as we find ourselves in a world served by technology, where you could sit in your box all day long and, quote, do your job, I think that that is way too constraining for what we need to do, which is why, as we now see innovation districts developing mm -hmm. in virtually mm -hmm. every city that has the capability to do it, we need to put a new emphasis on where people live and work, what they do in spare time, and how we all reaffirm our attachments with each other and how we build the kind of social networks and create an inclusivity that means everyone can be a part of moving forward. Right, and now I want to go um, to another idea, the idea of placemaking. It's a word that we hear increasingly when we talk about urban transformation. So based on your experience, what are the roles of the private sector and people sectors in place making and how best can we engage them in the process? Uh, this is a topic I've spent uh, uh, pursuing, how the private sector and the public sector mm -hmm. can work together, uh, define a business relationship that allows each to bring its capacity and its access to resources, both human resources and capital resources for, for building and, and, and creating the physical environment but also because they too want to find ways in which the work we both do, meaning the public side and the private side, that actually engages and makes people's lives better. Mm -hmm. So we started a while ago thinking about how do we create places? Well, it used to be we went to market and then that became a supermarket. So then we invented uh, uh, places of attraction on the waterfront where we went with our leisure time but more and more as the time when we're working, the time when we are relaxing, and the time when we are thinking creatively about what we should do next, they're all becoming blended together. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for now as we try to make places is, are, are the opportunities to bring people together in large number, but also in small number. So you have a wonderful town square but at the same time, you have the cafe at the corner where you meet and exchange ideas. And that differentiation that one was relaxing and one was working is being removed from our daily lives. We're actually working and sharing all of the time. And that gives us an opportunity to explore very, very different ways of being together. I do think that in designing the kind of places we're talking about, we have a responsibility to insist that it's a space for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's a place for everyone. The changes that we make should be seen as broadly welcoming. We should provide opportunities for people who are coming to visit to see how we, in a particular place, work and live. Uh, just replicating a place that was successful in London, Covent Garden here, would not be true to Singapore, nor would it bring out the best values. So I think that the work that we can do together, public and private sector, is to identify what is unique 
about where we are, how we put that forward in an attractive way, and how we mix our resources so that both people benefit, but we achieve greater goals for the people who live in our cities, for the people who want to come and enjoy them. Right. Um, and I want to move on to you know, the fact that, Marilyn, you've had very extensive experience in the design of key transit projects uh, around the world. This project is when done well, we know would present excellent opportunities for reimagining and revitalizing urban communities. For the planned high, street, uh, high speed rail from Kuala Lumpur to the new terminus that will be located at Jurong Lake District in the western part of Singapore, what would be your advice for planners uh, in order to harness the catalytic effects that such projects could lend to districts uh, that house this project? Well, that's a fascinating question mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, takes years to figure out. But just the way, the way that we think about high-speed rail is it's a marvelous way to link major cities together so that they can cooperate as well as compete. And the evidence exists around the world, beginning with the Japanese and the European who built these systems first, that that ability to collaborate, to meet face to face, not just over the internet, not just in terms of Skype, promotes in a relationship sharing of ideas in ways that are absolutely terrific. We also know that cities who prepare for the arrival of high-speed rail can capture even bigger benefits. If you have a decreased time of travel and you arrive in a center place where there are a number of destinations, where you can meet the people you want to do business with, where you can enjoy the culture of the place that you have come, that creates a new form of location, location, location. Mm. And it can be the catalyst for attracting the private development that is absolutely essential to achieve the public goals we set forth for our cities. So you find that around these stations, there is the capacity to build literally million square feet of millions of square feet of mixed use development that are flexibly used, inhabited by different groups of people because they enjoy being in immediate proximity with each other mm -hmm. and getting to know each other as the basis for doing the next deal and for accomplishing the next improvement. It's very exciting to me that infrastructure actually becomes not a physical system governed by its own laws, mm -hmm but essentially a means for getting people together ever more conveniently and ever more effectively. Right, and I think, you know, uh, in, in all the ideas you've shared today, you have always emphasized uh, the need to build communities instead of just infrastructure. And I think that has uh, been a pervasive part of your work and of the discussion today. So we learned a lot from you today and I've had several insights you know, from what you just said. So thank you very much, Marilyn. And um, you know, we hope to see you more and more often in Singapore now that you have a little bit more time for us. Well, I um, am always incredibly uh, uh, delighted to be invited back because working together with you uh, is a way that we get to exchange ideas and we each get to learn. There's one thing I'd like to add, sure. which is I think that when we talk about placemaking and public goals and private goals, the unique thing that designers can bring has to do with how people feel when they come to a place and how they enjoy the experience. Mm -hmm. A flight can be terrible or it can be easy. A train trip can be long and arduous or it could be quick. Mm -hmm. But when you arrive where you arrive, and I learned this from a British engineer, which makes it an even better lesson. It is very important that where you come makes you as an individual arriving in a place feel ennobled, and exhilarated. We're each important. 
and we each have something to offer. And I think it's a big responsibility for us as planners and designers to do everything we can to make that happen. Life is not just a process, it's an experience and one that we should truly enjoy. Right. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank, Thank you. you.